Okay. And when I saw that the uh, theme of this conference was going to be time, um, I was at the time supervising Elliot Chaplin here, this is Elliot, uh, who's just completed his um, Lit, or Masters by Research with us. I was supervising Elliot's thesis, and um, Elliot and I used to spend quite a lot of time on a Wednesday afternoon just chewing the cud, really, about the fifth century. And where we got to was almost harking back to some of the things I was thinking about as a master's student when I was thinking about <coughs> the problems of periodization, the problems of the structures uh, of time that we work with as archaeologists. And thus, when this conference came up, theme of time, I thought uh, it was a good moment to um, come and try and put a session together that thought about the fifth century and all of its problems from a theoretical perspective. So, one of my starting points for this uh, is, was really Gavin Lucas's book. It's quite old now, back in 2005. But Lucas, I think, had some useful things to say about time and periodization. So, he points out that periods allow yeah. us to divide and understand and organise the past, and that our periods tend to be an ordinal system. They have direction and they are relative. And I think that's important too. So when we split up our time into periods, what we're doing is we're producing periods of different lengths that follow one after the other. Now, at the same time, we've known for a very long while that our periods are constructions. They are, um, as Collingwood back in the 1920s said, you know, they're arbitrary fabrications, a part torn from its context. Um, and yet, we have to work with these periods and the parameters that they establish. And part of what this introductory talk is about is trying to think about what that means for the 5th century AD. Now, periods divide <coughs> linear industrial time. These are all concepts we're familiar with. Um, the past is a period, the present is a period, the future is a period, if you like. And on the board here, I have the uh, I have period boundaries uh, based on English heritage's um, units of time. And I don't, sorry, it's perhaps a little bit small at the back, but all you, uh, all you really need to know is you have period names here. We've got the Iron Age, which I haven't split down into its constituent parts. We've got the Roman period, the early Roman, the late Roman, early medieval, the early Saxon, middle Saxon, and the late Saxon. Now, all of these labels are problematic. If you work in Cardiff, for instance, the utility of early Saxon as a period name um, is probably quite debatable for the 5th and 6th centuries. I think it's all Peter Guest, Peter Guest crept in. Um, I'm sure Peter, you, you John, you probably wouldn't uh, feel that early Saxon is very valid for Wales in the 5th century. Well, certainly not for Wales, but it is for a large For area. other places it is. Um, <laughs> and one of, one of the things we look at, you know, one of the things that, uh, we can see when we look at these divisions of time is this break that runs through the 5th century. And the only, th oh, there we go, which is here. So lots of our periods end and start in the 5th century. The only one that doesn't is late antiquity. And I've put that on there just as a kind of nod um, to some of the things myself and Rob Collins were thinking about more than 10 years ago. Uh, for a little while, we tried to get people to use the term late antiquity because it avoided this fault line that runs through the 5th uh, century. Now, sticking with Lucas for a moment, um, and th this is really from a kind of personal perspective, uh, The Archaeology of Time was published in 2005 when I was writing up my PhD thesis. And I didn't, as those of you who have completed PhDs will know, as you get to the end, you stop reading and you start writing. And this, slipped, this book slipped me by it's passed me by um, in 2005. But there's a certain irony when I read it a few years later. And uh, Lucas says, the problem of the end of Roman Britain, how society changed after the departure of the Roman legions, is largely a fictitious problem of two incommensurable chronologies. For example, the production and certainly use of Roman pottery 
probably continued well into the fifth century. Um, and this was music to my ears, because here's, this is the cover of my PhD thesis, September 2005, which is all about pottery in the end of Roman Britain. Um, so I was, a certain irony. Uh, so Gavin Lucas in the Archaeology of Time telling me this wasn't a problem. I just spent four years of my life writing 90,000 words <laughs> on this very issue. So, for Lucas's <laughs> chronology, then, the two incommensurable chronologies are the problems where you're running an ordinal system, so units of non-specific duration, relative units of non-specific duration, uh, with an interval <coughs> system. You would see the Roman period as interval time. It's defined by two historical dates based on a calendar, so years. So there's AD 43 at the start, AD 410 at the end. And he would see our problems with both the beginning and the end of the Roman period as being <coughs> related to how those, um, how the two ends of the Roman period dovetail with the ordinal Iron Age or early medieval periods. So, if we move then, perhaps, from how Lucas has thought about time to thinking about the 5th century, what's sometimes referred to as the 5th century problem. And the 5th century has many problems, and some of us in this room have spent too much of our lives worrying about them, I suspect. Um, the, the challenge of the 5th century is it is phenomenally elusive archaeologically. And we would all, I think, accept that in Britain. And what we have tended to do, I think, is create model, you know, one size top down models that explain why the 5th century is elusive. So you go, well, the 5th century is elusive <coughs> because the Roman Empire falls, that brings about social and economic and political collapse. Everybody disappears, lives in an invisible fashion. And for lots of us, I think, and I would include myself in this, I've treated the 5th century largely as an empirical <coughs> problem. If you can find the right sequences, if you can find the right stuff, you can uh, somehow interrogate that block of time. You can find the 5th century. And a lot of what I've worked on over the past um, 20 years, I suppose, has been about finding uh, the 5th century. But I think also, more fundamentally, there's a theoretical issue here, and it is about those periods. It is about the boundaries between um, our periods. And Elliot, perhaps you'll hand these out. And really it's to do um, with how we conceive of objects as time. And uh, just in case any of you need a little bit of therapy after last night, uh, you're being handed out um, an activity sheet which is aimed at primary school children, which asks you to choose between Roman and Anglo-Saxon objects. Now, as archaeologists, <coughs> we know at some level that objects are not time. But on the other hand, the way we think about the past often uses objects as proxies for time. So here we've got Thomson, the inventor of the three age system, iron, bronze, um, and stone. And these objects become proxies for periods of time. And I would, I would encourage us to think a little bit about, if you like, the pedagogy of this. Um, I, for the past six years, have been teaching uh, a first-year course called Introduction to Archaeology. <coughs> and one of the things, if you teach a first-year course, is you have to, you have to deliver uh, what in the jargon of teaching nowadays is sometimes termed threshold concepts. How do you get the students to understand the concepts that allow them to access the periods under study. And one of the first things we do, and I suspect many of you may do if you're teaching, um, is you tell students that objects are not intrinsically datable, but after saying that, you then spend the rest of their three years talking about Roman pottery, or digging up pieces of pottery, and the first thing <coughs> you say, what date is that, or brooches, or whatever. And we explain this. Here's a picture from Renfrew and Barnes' first year textbook, um, you know, which puts prehistoric axes against cars. And we see this uh, around us. 
And we use these kind of familiar concepts to explain this idea of objects and time to our students. I'm, I, I, find that, I find that kind of um, pivot point quite interesting, where we go from saying, well, objects aren't intrinsically datable, to then just going, well, objects are there, actually, they're all about time. What, what date is this object? And I think that's something that we've not really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We've not really problematized, we've not really thought about. So, I owe this to Elliot. I think one of our challenges then is how we think about objects in the past. And in terms of periodization, there is a tendency, I think, to see, <coughs> there is a tendency, I think, to see uh, objects in their periods as discrete. So oil on water, if you have two periods, they don't mix, the objects in them do not mix, or the sites or whatever. And on the right hand side here, you've got milk in water, milk emulsion, which shows the mixing. So here we've got perhaps a kind of metaphor for how we think about objects uh, in periods. So, I'm going to hand over to Elliot in a minute, but uh, before I do that, I think we have periods and we have stuff that we assign to those periods. Um, I don't know what you want to call that stuff. Gavin Lucas likes residues, so we can call them residues if you like. Term I'm not very comfortable with, but let's call them residues. They become part of this cultural and chronological package. And outside of that period, those residues uh, either become uninteresting, i.e. residual. Those of us who work in commercial archaeology will know all about residual material and how upset project managers get when you try to quantify residual material. Um, or special, so these things become somehow more important because they're out of their time. And then we create interpretations to explain, if you like, the synchronicity of the material record with our periodization. And I, that's, <coughs> this kind of cycle is, um, is what I think is sort of going on with the fifth uh, with the 4th to 5th century transition, that we're packaging stuff either side of 400. And that's a theoretical uh, standpoint that is causing us to do that, some, rather than it being a reflection, if you like, of what was actually happening. And if we're, if we're going to, um, if we're going to think about this critically, then why, if our objects are not intrinsically datable, why should they be confined by the boundaries of these historical and ordinal periods? So, Elliot, over to you. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly, really, uh, as a bit of an aside, about a particular case study of objects um, that were highlighted by Ellen Swift in 2012 <coughs> as these um, late Roman copper alloy script bracelets uh, that she says were recycled at the very end of the, uh, of the Roman period or the post-Roman period, uh, cut down and twisted into these sorts of very simple finger rings. And uh, interestingly, this was a, Alan Swift identified this as being a, something that was particularly associ associated with the very end of the Roman period or the start of the post-Roman period. Uh, some of these finger rings were found at Gillingham in Kent, which uh, was a site which had a whole host of Roman material, but some Anglo-Saxon material culture, but uh, virtually nothing as far as uh, structural evidence is concerned. They found this uh, Neudam style brooch, and these spearheads were found in this sort of dark earth deposit over here, and a coin list that stretched right into uh, 402 AD. And so I guess really the question that I wanted to highlight with these uh, fingerings is that they are, you know, late Roman by, by design, but ultimately are not necessarily late Roman objects. They're found in uh, Anglo-Saxon contexts, uh, as well as being made from you know, late Roman material. They're ultimately ubiquitous, and this is a, 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 um, a map that I made of the distribution of them just on, from the data from the PAS, which isn't you know, a, a not complete by any means. 
Um, but I think really it's, it's an interesting problem in a case study to look at because these rings ultimately are straddling that threshold between the uh, Roman period and the post-Roman period, and that's are really problematic to think about them in terms of these binary oppositions. I'm going to hand back over to James now. Thanks. So if we return then to this diagram, where we have this kind of flow of know, information interpretation, where are we left? Well, I think you know, we have to ask ourselves, should we try and break free of this? Should we try and think of other ways of uh, thinking about our material? And how do we separate, if you like, temporality from the materiality of our uh, assemblages? And should we actually engage in a deconstruction of our periods? I'm not sure what we'd replace them with, but perhaps there is some value in thinking about whether um, those period boundaries, which are also disciplinary boundaries, which can also be institutional boundaries, whether they're actually um, helpful to us understanding the past. So um, I'll end uh, with <coughs> two quotations and a, some pictures of some chimney pots. Um, so back in 2007, Whitmore's um, Manifesto on Symmetrical Archaeology uh, talked, um, and I know Elliot likes this, talked about how time is turbulent and time percolates, and how pasts are regarded as not exclusively past. And something of the past exists in the material here and now. It's accorded <laughs> action, and multiple pasts continue to mediate aspects of people's lives in a multiplicity of ways today. Now, um, one of, one of the things I like about archaeology is that we're meant to be able to see the long durée. And when I read that quotation, I was reminded of something that Philip Ratz had written way back in 1982, which in rather less words says much the same thing. And he said, we must imagine that they, this is the Dark Age um, inhabitants of Somerset, uh, Where's Howard? When we could still use the term Dark Age. <laughs> they were much influenced by memories of Roman times and continually conscious of its physical residues. There's Ratz being a bit precise with his terminology there. Physical residues in decaying towns, villas, temples, and roads. So both of these quotations, I suppose, remind us that that material was still in existence. Well, you know, sometimes, I think, when we read about the 5th century, there's always this kind of feeling that something happened and everybody dropped everything in 410. And I, I find that deeply problematic. And we have to really think about why, if they did do that, why they did that. Um, and if they didn't, what that means for us and our understanding of the period. And the chimney pots, I quite like chimney pots. Um, I recently rebooted the chimney pot on my house. Uh, I had a log burner installed and thus my residual, meaningless, anachronistic chimney pot has been brought back into use. Um, so they're part of the past, aren't they? But are still here today, active and being used. Uh, they're often hoarded. Think of our architectural salvage yards. You can think of hordes of chimney pots. These are kept until, because they have some value and people use them for things. And sometimes they're reworked, reimagined in completely different ways uh, today as garden ornaments or whatever. So I think chimney pots are quite a useful way of thinking actually about some of the uh, Roman stuff in the fifth century. Is it being used? Is it being <coughs> stored, maintained, reworked? Is it being repurposed, refashioned, understood in a new way? And I've been talking for 20 minutes, so I should probably stop. But I would encourage you to think a little bit about that sheet on your desk. Okay? We learn that objects are time very, very young. Well, this is primary school. This is aimed at primary school children. And actually cutting through that and thinking about that relationship more critically is what I hope um, some of the papers uh, in this session will do. So thank you for listening. Um, James, I think you're up next.